but and lately they've been doing a lot of talk about, I mean, Sue Carlson talked about the lenient, was Jesus Christ really lenient? Was he always a goody two shoes and stuff? But he, like today we, we learned in John's uh, fellowship, but he was real specific in his, in his ideas and his parables he was talking about. And the reason he spoke in parables because nobody wanted to ask the serious questions. What are you talking about? What do you mean? Because they really didn't want to know. They had their own system. The Pharisees and the Sad. They had their own system going. They didn't want. To, they didn't. They just. They wanted to see what was inside his head and accuse him and find ways of doing stuff. But the apostles said, "You guys ask the questions, and he give them the answers." So it's like he was talking to them. You got to search and find and ask, and you'll be, you know, given to you, you know. And, and he talked about the glory of kings, you know, and, and uh, searching the word and asking God to reveal stuff to you. And the world is more like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that just want to say, I'm fine, don't bother me. You know, I don't, I'm not a sinner, I'm not a bad person, you know, God's going to take me and whatever's going to happen. And, and the world's really into just listening to them, you know, that uh, when we get to heaven, God will maybe finding his way I was a good person and uh, I know that uh, Franklin Graham just changed his little advertisement on TV but they're all so all saying confess your sins and bring Jesus into your life and they're good messages but I wonder if they're really John 10 or uh, Romans 10 9 and 10 is it really taking Jesus as your Lord because you know like I believe in George Washington only because I read books about him and saw his face on the, with the dollar bill and stuff, you know? So is it really something, is he my Lord? You know, I just know that when you read the constitution, the stuff, now I can believe in someone that really existed when you read the history of George Washington and, and all the things that he did. And he was a very religious man. Uh, you know, if you cussed in his army and he caught you, they whipped you. You know I mean? He was pretty, it was pretty amazing. Uh, he was a very disciplined person, and uh, for what he had, he did great things. But uh, well, I want to look in Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the first one we're going to go into is Matthew uh, 3 1. And uh, I'll just read it, what I've got written <clears throat> from, the, from the REV. Uh, and in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. For this is he who is spoken by the prophet Isaiah, a voice calling out of the desert, Make ready for the road to Yahweh, make it pass straight. And uh, isn't it amazing that uh, John picked up on that today in his teaching it's called the kingdom. I didn't know this in Matthew, kingdom of heaven, because he was a Jew. And it, now I have been reading that the first book of Matthew is the only gospel that probably they're thinking was originated in Hebrew and not Greek like the others. And so he would say the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God, because they weren't allowed to use that word God. They always used Lord, remember, in the Old Testament or changed it. So they call it the kingdom of heaven. That, and I was just reading that this morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.30, whenever we got up. And uh, this, that new Bentov uh, meeting, uh, I actually went on the website and looked at all this Aramaic or Hebrew and how they got the, they translated a little bit different. And they think it's Hebrew. Matthew was Hebrew. And for years, they just, just can't, just uh, said, no, that can't be right. They're all in Greek. And then the more evidence comes in, they think it's more in Hebrew. And what really, and now I'm sidetracking here, but uh, I know some people around here, they've come into the idea that when it says Abba Father, that that's a more endearing word like daddy. And it, it's almost become a doctrine. And I'm sitting there going, well, does that mean I can call him pops? Or, 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 or you know, so we're losing the father thing and we're saying it's more endearing than father. Well, father was really endearing to someone back then and the culture at the time they didn't have to say daddy you know uh but i think we taught on this before but uh and all it was was matthew saying abba what jesus called his dad abba and then the greek for the greeks that were later on they put a comma and said father to explain to him what father baba meant 
So anyway, that's, so Matthew is, is talking and we're we'll going to verse four. Now this, now this John had clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Uh, then Jerusalem and all Jeru Judea and all the regions around the Jordan were going out to him and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, openly confessing their sins. And uh, there's some great commentary on that. Uh, but we'll keep going because this is Matthew. But when, we, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to his baptism, he said to them, you offspring of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath that is about to come. Now, this is not Jesus talking. This is John the Baptist getting a word of revelation about these guys. And uh, it's kind of like he doesn't hold back on them. And it's kind of interesting over the last couple of years that when you go from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, God has always given us choices, free will choices. Or as you know, the Calvinists say you don't really have free will, God determines and stuff like this. And a lot of churches that are affected, God determines everything for you. And yet God sits right around and says, no, you got to have a free will choice to do this. And then he gives you choices. And then being a just God, he said, and a loving God, he gives you the results of those choices. You know, you got life or death. That's a good one. So choose life. Oh, duh. You know, but people want to, oh, I got enough today. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm going to worry about heaven and later on, you know, it's so, you know, that's their choice. But, and John the Baptist is telling these guys, and it's pretty interesting because they're not going to confess their sins. See, they're, that's too embarrassing, or they don't have any sins, whatever. Or who are you, John? And uh, and he says, come now, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And he says, you know, you need to bring some fruit so God can see what you're doing. But you guys are just hiding behind your clothes and rock, you know, and, and uh, your titles and just doing that. And do you not think that you can say within yourself, we have Abraham as our father, or say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham, even from these stones? And if you look in the New Testament, when they're talking uh, with Paul, remember, they were hung up on circumcision. It had to be circumcised. It had to be, that's, you know, and, and Paul was dis, dis, uh, dissing uh, Moses and all this stuff. Uh, so now these guys are, you know, we're Abraham. And it was a common thought. If you were Jewish, you were the in crowd, okay? And, and, and they kind of were, but they still had to be righteous in front of God. They had, still had to do righteous living. And he, then he goes in and talks about those Pharisees and the, uh, Sadducees and all them. And he says, uh, the ax is already laid down at the root of the trees. And this is a, we call it a hypocasasis. It's a figure of speech used in the Bible for leaders, trees or leaders in the community. And the ax is laid down. We might not think of this, but back in that culture, I guess it'd be very, oh, uh, yeah, I get it. Uh, therefore, every tree that does not bring forth good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. There's the context, into the fire. And we know that is the, uh, the, the fire of Gehenna or the furnace, that type of thing, and thrown into the fire. And he says, and John's saying, I baptize you in water as a symbol of your repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit or with fire. And I think in the King James and many modern versions, or the NIV, it's always uh, baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. And I never knew what that meant. I always thought it was like when the 12 apostles got the, on Pentecost, they got the fire come, clothes like fire coming down on top of their heads. Or they had, uh, uh, and some commentator, commentators say it's more like the, the fire of God inside your belly, you know, gets it up and then, uh, but that, uh, Word fire is the word, or the word, uh, or is the word kai, K A I. So we're going to go over to uh, Luke chapter 3. We're going to verse 3, and uh, we'll explain why they use, the REV uses or, or, uh, or fire, or instead of and fire. Uh, and, and he, 
John the Baptist went into the whole region around the Jordan preaching baptism as a sign of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And I think in Matthew was talking about they're coming out to see John and now John's going in the whole region. So it, it's giving you a different uh, peek on the things that John was doing. Uh, and the same, same uh, a voice, one calling out in the desert in verse four is the same one that they uh, quoted before. And he adds a little bit. And uh, so he began saying to the multitudes that went out to be baptized by him, you offspring of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Another stern warning to, all the, to the uh, multitudes. And then he explains it. Come now, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance and do not begin to say in yourself, we have Abraham as our father. And he repeats what uh, Matthew did. And then it said, Indeed, the axe is ready, and always now he's uh, the root of the trees. And every tree that doesn't bring forth fruit will put, cut down, blow it into fire. And the multitudes were asking him, saying, what should we do? Uh, and he answered them and said, the one who has two coats, let him ha give one to him, and who has none, and one who has food, let him do likewise. And the tax collectors, now we get into tax collectors, also came to be baptized, and they were the crooks of the day, you know. And they said to him, too, what should we do? And, and he said, collect no more than what you have been ordered to do, which was really their job, but they always seemed to be pretty rich people and lived in nice houses and everything else. And the soldiers asked him, saying, oh, what should we do? And he said to them, don't extort money from anyone by threats. Either accuse anyone wrongfully and be content with your wages. And that kind of brings my mind to uh, Paul when he got the uh, arrested that all he needed was maybe pay a little uh, money to the, the king and he, he could get out but he never wouldn't do it so he ended up going to Rome uh, and while the people were filled in verse 15 while the people were filled with expectation and everyone was questioning their hearts concerning John if he was the Christ John answered saying to them all I indeed baptize you in water but the one who is great, mightier than I, that is coming. The strap whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit or with fire, as the RV says. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly cleanse the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. So now, so you can see the context in this is that the, the, the trees are going to get cut down and, and the chaff, are, the people are going to be separated he's between the chaff and, he's gonna, and the wheat and he's going to burn them all up. And what I got, I read some of the commentary on that word Kai and, it, and it's a, uh, it's kind of interesting because so many of these Greek words that you read up got about five or six or seven different meanings, depending on the translation. You know, you can read it one way and then read it a different way. And uh, one of my favorite was always the word uh, fear. They always say, well, that means reverence to God. But there, there is a, about six different meanings to that word and referencing it could be a healthy fear of God too, you know, and what's going to happen. But uh, it's a flex, Kai is a flex, flexible, a very flexible and usage can, can mean, uh, it can mean and, uh, and get, but, neither, and uh, the, let's see, neither and then and so, and indeed, nevertheless, also, likewise, and in some circumstances, uh, and he, he gave up, or, it means or, and he uses Acts 26, 1 Corinthians 7, 7, 13, and, uh, we could look those up, but, it, but it's like no Jew or Greek, uh, slave or free, and it's the word Kai, male or female, the word Kai. So that's, luckily I didn't have to do that research, but there it is. And it's, uh, so it starts explaining why he, John is saying baptism with uh, spirit or fire. And it's really under, uh, he's not talking about Holy Spirit, Pentecost, after he's talking about when you die like in john 3 that the god will raise them from the dead and they will receive holy spirit and be in the first 
post-millennial kingdom, the first resurrection. He's talking about that spiritual body that they will have that's prophesied. It always, you know, it's always been prophesied that God's going to lay out a spirit. And so basically what he does is talking about, and they expected that when they got raised from the dead, they would have spirit filled bodies and be in the millennial kingdom. And so what God did is when Jesus uh, rose from the dead, he says, okay, I got this new thing. I call the church. I'm going to give him spirit now instead of later on. So that's, uh, but it's still when the Jews uh, and then well, the old Testament believers get raised from the dead, they will receive a, a spiritual body. And now we can go into Mark. Now in Mark, it's kind of interesting that he never says Holy Spirit or fire. He just says Holy Spirit. He never mentions all three all three verses about uh, the chaff and the and the uh, the trees, the fruitless trees, and the chaff being burned, and uh, the, bat, the Messiah baptizing in fire. And Mark focuses Mark focuses on the humble and the righteous people that came out that were willing to confess their sins and get baptized and uh, cleansing. You know, and and it was up to them. They knew because it was a symbol that they would carry on being that once they were humble enough and they would confess their sins, they could carry that out because in the old Testament, we know that they had to carry out their righteousness in order to get salvation because self righteousness was equal to our salvation. Pretty much in the old Testament, we had this righteousness. So they had, it was a day by day thing. Of course, the Pharisees didn't want anything part of it. Uh, so he parked, he, Mark focuses on the repentant people and those people, uh, righteous, that became righteous in the sight of God because of their confession and their act of water baptism, I guess you could say. Going to uh, Mark 1, 4. It's kind of interesting that they're this is a side topic. Then uh, Mark is the servant gospel. That you're in Mark one, and you already uh, John's baptizing in water, and Jesus is coming to him. There's no genealogy. There's none of that stuff. And it was interesting because God doesn't put it in there because there is no genealogy for a servant. They don't care about your genealogy. They care about what you do, working for the master. Does that make sense? So they don't put a genealogy, and that's why when you you go in the RV and go to 16.9, which you don't have to do, you'll find out that that's the end of the Gospel of Mark and all the extra stuff that's in there has been added by scribes or theologians later on. Uh, because the death of Christ in Mark is the end of his ministry, his suffering servant. Now, he suffered, he's still a servant, but he, now he's Lord, but then he's just a servant. So then when he's dead, it's time to get a new servant. That's how they, they thought about servants, you know. That, that's the end of his work. So it, that was pretty interesting. So, And John, in verse 4, John came baptizing in the desert, preaching a baptism as a sign of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole region of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem uh, were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, openly confessing their sins. And John was closed. We knew that. And... Uh, and uh, verse 8, he says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with Holy Spirit, and there's no fire. And these are the people. It's just a different perspective in Mark than the other two, because he's dealing with the, a true people that want to uh, see the kingdom of God. They want to see the uh, future kingdom. They want to be part of that uh, messianic kingdom. And he, and uh, that's his, that was his ministry. The kingdom is near. So... And then you fast forward to Pentecost, and you find that, uh, I'm going to say this, is nowhere has it ever talked about, confess your sins and make Jesus Lord. But it always talks about when you make Jesus Lord, make, uh, I believe God raises from the dead, for the remission of sins, which is a throwback to the Christ's death, because that was the 
thing that took care of all the sin, future. It took his death to take, that's why pre-Christ, pre it's uh, confess your sins, and now we confess, what they call it, to confess the Savior from sin. And then, uh, of course, logically, as you grow up and to church, you know, the people we believe and stuff, when you do sin, you still have to confess that what you goofed up and God forgives you. And uh, that's called the sprinkling of the blood. That's pretty interesting. So, so we have that Romans 10, 9, and it's kind of interesting. We've got a whole new system where we just confess Christ and everything he did and believe God raised him from the dead. And it's so important that we keep that in our minds versus because I just listen to a lot of people want to confess sin. And, and a lot of people say, well, I'm not really a sinner. I'm a good guy. So, so let's confess the Savior from sin. So, and, uh, and that's why they, ha they had to be righteous. They had to do the baptism, confess their sins so they could remain righteous and keep that life going in the Old Testament. And then all of a sudden in the New Testament, we come in and God says, I'm declaring you righteous. I think some burdens say they, God makes you righteous, but it's, the emphasis is on de declaration, like the Declaration of Independence. It's like, does just the Lord hammer down and there you go. So anyway, that's what I wanted to teach tonight. And uh, there you go, folks. <laughs>